Hello, everyone. Uh, so just uh, sorry for the glitch. Okay, uh, so let's start. Uh, just confirm in the uh, link below that uh, in the comment section that uh, I'm uh, we are audible and uh, our screen is visible. Okay, uh, I think, uh, I mean, this is for the first time we are doing this, uh, a live event. So I believe uh, there is some lag with regards to uh, my voice as well as uh, the video. So I'll keep the video off so that the streaming is on. Okay, uh, shall we begin? Okay, perfect then. So welcome to the day one of our two days webinar on uh, deep learning with Monk. I am Abhishek. Uh, I'm currently working as a CTO at Tessellate Imaging. 
and uh, tessellate imaging works in the field of uh, computer vision and deep learning. Uh, so first of all, we would like to thank uh, GGG Nagpur, Google Developers Group Nagpur and Sohail for giving us this wonderful opportunity. Uh, we also like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, our goal uh, for these two sessions will be to provide you with necessary toolkits that will help you create, manage, deploy deep learning and computer vision applications. Uh, we'll start with a basic introduction to our company. Uh, then we'll move on to uh, the introductions uh, for computer vision, image processing, deep learning terminologies. Then quickly, we'll go through various industries uh, that computer vision uh, is involved with. And post that, this post this theoretical introduction, we'll dive right into our open source low code toolkit, that is Monk and start creating uh, image classification and object detection applications using the same. So uh, today, uh, Myself, Abhishek, and Akash will be taking this lecture. And uh, so Akash is my co-founder in my company. And uh, he has more than seven years of experience working in the field of computer vision and deep learning. Uh, we both are Bitspilani graduates. Uh, we passed out in 2016. And uh, to give you a brief about our past, uh, we started learning and experimenting with image processing and deep learning in the second year of our engineering college. And uh, since then, uh, we have actually stuck to this field, luckily. And uh, this field is growing at an immense rate. Uh, during this time, we interned with a decent set of companies across the globe. Uh, like in Italy, there was a, a company that was working on variable AI powered glasses. Then in Japan, there was another that was generating 3D faces out of your 2D selfies. Uh, we are also part of MIT Media Labs, Massachusetts Media Labs, India initiative startup called as Tesseract Imaging, uh, which created a 360 uh, camera for panoramic and VR suitable images. And uh, but they also recently got featured in TED India show that is hosted by Shah Rukh Khan. So, uh, that is that was our past post that we st started uh, researching. I mean, I started researching on autonomous vehicles along with Tata Alexi in Bangalore. And Akash began his research on sports analytics uh, that was uh, specifically in basketball. Uh, this was with a company called Coach Cam in USA. Uh, just a fun fact, by the way, uh, Akash has backed the second highest job placement uh, in our year placements, uh, even after having a CGP of mere five. So you can connect with him later to get some tips on the same. Uh, Akash, uh, I would request you to please introduce uh, sure. yourself. Sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how this uh, series is going to go ahead is like uh, we'll divide uh, the entire series. We have divided the entire series into two days. Uh, today is the first day and in the very first hour, I'll be going through some theoreticals. I'll introduce uh, Monk open source library to all of you. Post that, Akash will start with uh, all the coding work uh, on Collab. <coughs> so about our company, Tessellate Imaging. Uh, Tessellate Imaging, uh, we work in the uh, space of computer vision and deep learning. We uh, post our jobs, we started up uh, this company, the startup, where we act as consultants and development partners for companies that do not have any in-house expertise in the field of deep learning and computer vision. Uh, it's been three years now and we have had an exciting journey till now. And uh, I'll show you uh, certain places, certain uh, applications that we have worked with. 
So uh, as you can see, uh, we worked on ADAS systems, uh, security and surveillance, then in the domain of ma marketing, basically computer vision in the domain of marketing. So in ADAS systems, you can see different object detection, uh, uh, on-road object detection, lane estimation, pose estimation, pose that, and uh, security and surveillance. We'll all go through these uh, different applications soon. Then in marketing, uh, again, uh, understanding the behavior of the consumer, where in the aisle the person, a uh, consumer spends most of the time, things like that. <clears throat> Okay, so this is our team at Tessellate Imaging. Mr. Adish Shrivastav is our CEO and he handles the complete business and the management end. He was with us in our college uh, at Bits Pilani and uh, we have had a very exciting journey from uh, doing projects to, uh, to starting a company and now uh, creating our own library. Uh, this is our 15 member team. Uh, Hemant uh, is a graduate from NIT Nagpur and he's one of the first and the core contributors of to the Monk library. Arijit and Mahek uh, from Bitskoa uh, and along with uh, Sinchana from Ramaya Institute uh, have recently joined us as uh, interns. Uh, we also have two very active machine learning groups contributing to our work. Uh, so the people from there are Ashwin, Gaurav, Heath, and Rizul. The, they are from Bits Pilani's Society of Artificial Intelligence and Deep Learning. Check out this group. Uh, and then uh, we have Rohit, Ayush, Jayesh, Sayan, and Shreyas from uh, NIT Nagpur's IV Lab. Uh, Shubham and uh, Shubham basically joined us later and. <clears throat> That's it from the team side, I guess. So this is pretty much about us. Uh, let's dive into the world of uh, deep learning. Uh, before that, Akash, can you confirm is there a lag between the video and the uh, uh, voice? Yes, there is the small slight lag. Um, huh. So whenever you switch slides, I would just say take a 10, 15 second pause. Uh, got it. I mean, uh, it's, I'm unable to understand it from here. So, <laughs> okay. So uh, deep learning, uh, let's continue. Deep learning forms a subset of machine learning algorithms, uh, which in uh, turn form a small part of the giant AI world. Uh, this AI that we all refer to when we, are, when we are considering deep learning is what is called as a narrow AI, meaning uh, it can do only a limited number of tasks, like a narrow AI uh, trained to understand humans and vehicles on the road cannot directly be used to understand uh, a brain tumor from an MRI image. So, okay. So when we talk about machine learning and deep learning, there is a very slight difference that comes in uh, these two. So, and the difference is basically on the part of feature engineering. Simply put, both make uh, uh, the computer learn about a certain thing, both machine learning and deep learning. Uh, let's take our face for an example. For machine learning, we need to specify certain features, such as what the general shape of a face is, mathematically, uh, obviously, what are the arrangements of the different facial parts, etc., and then feed these features into the system. Whereas in deep learning, most of the feature understanding is done by the algorithm itself. Uh, 
out. When we move to the core of our webinar, the image processing and the computer vision part, image processing is basically any manipulation that you do on an image. You change the brightness, you change the contrast, you go with uh, different uh, operations that provide you with uh, the filters, the Instagram filters. These are like the image processing uh, uh, applications. Whereas, when we talk about computer vision, it is more on understanding what's in the image. And a lot of times these two terms are used interchangeably. Uh, to For easy differentiation, you can remember it as image processing is manipulating the image, whereas computer vision is getting insights from those image. Again, I'll repeat, image processing is manipulating the image to make it better to make it more lucrative, visible. Whereas computer vision is applying algorithms on top of it to get insights from the image. So for getting these insights, certain elements from different uh, science domains have to be used, like in 3D image processing, photogrammetry, uh, a lot of geometry uh, is applied. In machine learning and deep learning, most of you might be aware uh, that a lot of algebra and calculus is put into the use. For efficient programming, I mean, when you are writing a program and creating application, choosing the right data structures and algorithms is a must. So you see here, uh, mathematics, uh, pattern recognition, uh, artificial intelligence, I mean, a part of machine learning and deep learning, the core of image processing, physics, digital signal processing, everything gets combined. <clears throat> so we'll stick to our goal of application development rather than uh, diving deep into the mathematics and algorithms. Slowly, you can go ahead and learn about these algorithms. And uh, along with uh, the application development part, we'll uh, simultaneously introduce our Monk uh, toolkit. Uh, but before all this, uh, I would like to introduce you to the different image processing and computer vision fields that are uh, the computer vision algorithms that are being used in different industries uh, all over the world. So the reason for this is it will give you an idea about how large this industry is, how big the scope is for you once you enter the field and and start learning, of course. And uh, this will invoke the creative side of you to think of. Uh, automations in different industries in your respective industries. The first we have here is uh, noise removal. Uh, as you can see, uh, this problem has been present since the age uh, of simple signal processing. Wherever, I mean, wherever there were messages or data being transmitted from one place to another, it always had uh, uh, no noise removal uh, component attached to it. So here uh, we are using complex deep learning algorithms to get uh, the right uh, image from a noisy one. We are, the noise here is salt and pepper noise. Another industry where noise removal is used, which I can think of at present is astronomy as well as underwater image processing. So the data coming from space probes, satellites, they require a lot of pre-processing and noise removal forms a part of it. And underwater image processing heavily uses noise removal algorithms. So like this uh, in this image, uh, uh, this is from a software called as Adobe Lightroom that is using post processing of underwater images. <clears throat> Pause this. we move to image enhancement. Once the noise is removed, we have to enhance the image. I guess uh, the slide is taking a little longer to load. Uh, I'll uh, keep waiting till the slide actually loads onto the system. Yeah, uh, so if you see on the left, there is a, a blur in the image and we have to remove that. Second, in the domain of uh, satellite imaging, we have to enhance the image to get the best possible visible image. 
so uh, very lucrative very new uh, technology uh, called as generative adversarial networks scan has come into picture that is being used to do all these things so if you see drones the images have to be stabilized as drones keep maneuvering through different weather conditions and uh, to stabilize that image a lot of uh, hardware plus software and is mixed and uh, uh, the image is uh, stabilized and enhanced so that we get we get to use it for computer vision next is uh, panorama image stitching i guess everyone is aware of what panorama images are like if you see in the slides uh, you take multiple pictures or a continuous video and try to stitch the same and you create a uh, complete uh, one single image out of it uh, these days this has been uh, moved into uh, a, a 3d vr views to ar and vr views so i'm just uh, uh, letting you know uh, of the different uh, computer vision industry different uh, industries that are using computer vision so that you get an idea of things so uh, like this uh, depth estimation getting understanding how far an object is is a very important uh, 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 procedure for autonomous navigation in uh, self driving cars or any other navigation you say uh, sp uh, space vehicles all those things so this depth can be approximated to get the distance of the object from the camera now here i can show, uh, tell you about the difference between com uh, computer vision and image processing getting a depth from a stereo camera is on the image processing end whereas getting the depth from a single camera is on the deep learning and computer vision end the current slide is on in painting and uh, in painting is a technique that is used to restore old paintings that are now being digitized for the future uh, it also uh, uh, <clears throat> it is also used to edit photos like uh, i can show you an nvidia tool where uh, different uh, techniques are being used this is more like your photoshop where different techniques are being used to remove uh, certain uh, parts of your face or remove a complete up uh, completely remove a person from the entire uh, image so now i think it's loaded so you can have a look at it uh, akash uh, can you please share the link of google slides on uh, the chat uh, i guess a lot of uh, requests are for the same sure sure and also uh, till the time you look at it uh, someone has asked about what is ip cv ml dl so uh, these are the short forms for ip is image processing cv computer vision ml machine learning dl deep learning easy for us to remember and speak on it so once uh, these uh, once the once you have uh, seen the nvidia playground research playground we move towards object recognition that is the most common used uh, technique the most common used algorithm or say a set suite of algorithms that is used in almost every industry you say self driving cars there is uh, object recognition on roads you say medical imaging uh there is uh, a, a detection of tumors or cancerous elements from the mris and x rays you say satellite imagery comes the uh, agri tech object detection or analyzing different buildings roads so uh, a lot many things come into the picture with object detection comes tracking okay so what tracking does is tracking helps you uh carry out or hello sorry uh, sorry for the uh, interruption i uh, this was something related on the internet so yeah uh, continuing with the tracking part so tracking could be done on uh, any or detected objects like uh, one in this car where you are uh, simply taking uh, a video from one security camera 
and uh, tracking those images across all the other videos or uh, other video cams in the city. So it could be used for security and surveillance, traffic management systems. Another very good application would be in the defense part, where you keep tracking people across multiple cameras that are on the nation's border. So this is, these are the very three important industries where tracking could really be used. Then uh, post this, uh, we have image style transfer. So uh, if you look at the pictures, uh, you will see this is more like your Instagram filters that you see regularly, where you upload a photo, you choose a style and the uh, image is converted into that style. So here it's mostly like uh, converting, I mean, experiencing if uh, experiencing your uh, real world image, if that were to be created or painted by this painter who has done this. Pose that a very cool tool uh, that has come into the picture is uh, colorizing black and white images. Uh, it got famous, uh, I think, an year back on a lot of different, uh, <clears throat> uh, lot of different uh, apps and uh, people were using this as a fun tool. But uh, it's actually a very good tool where you get to colorize an image autom automatically and it looks real. I mean, if the face was pink or if the face was completely bluish or, uh, I mean, a, a very unnatural color, you wouldn't have felt that the colorization has been good or not. So uh, in that way, <clears throat> uh, this deep learning application is real good. Pose this, uh, I, I mentioned earlier too about photogrammetry. So I guess I will wait for the image to load. So photogrammetry is basically uh, creating 3D structures of, out of uh, two, multiple 2D images. So this comes under the work of 3D image reconstruction. So if you see this uh, image, uh, the blue patches you see are drone, is a drone flying over a mineral mine. And the blue patches are where at the, the positions where the uh, pics have been clicked. So using these images and uh, GPS coordinates of the position where the image was clicked, a complete 3D model is created. And this 3D model can be measured actually uh, against sizes, volumes, uh, distance between two points, any sort of uh, mathematical uh, measurement can be done using this. Uh, and this has a lot of potential in the mining and construction space. Uh, like uh, if you want to remotely monitor the progress of how your construction work is happening, how the mining is happening, etc. After this, uh, we have a very important uh, application, uh, very important sector of deep learning called as scene understanding, where, uh, <clears throat> where you analyze what type of scene it actually is, indoor versus outdoor, or what kind of activity is being carried out inside the image or a video. So this can be actually used to generate tags for social media. Like uh, if you post a, a picture on Instagram and it uh, automatically says hashtag ocean, hashtag out, uh, hashtag, I mean, Insta ocean or whatever uh, the term is. Uh, I'm not a, a very big Insta geek, so I won't remember, I won't know uh, such uh, tags, but uh, the people who use it regularly would definitely understand. Uh, or if you see uh, content creators uh, or wedding photographers, if uh, the uh, all the photographs are being automatically tagged and sorted, like for uh, the reception, like for the wedding or an outside shoot, different things. Uh, so this is a very important application. Uh, scene understanding also plays a very vital role in computers, uh, computer vision, because it gives the computer a context about where the image was taken. Now, suppose if it's an outside on-road image, we won't go and look for a computer there, or the system would won't go and look for a computer there. So there is uh, this is one of the places where scene understanding can help the computer. This you might have uh, seen in Google's uh, auto translate uh, ads uh, these days, where you click a picture containing some text and it recognizes it 
automatically. So this is text detection in the wild. And uh, uh, basically, you detect the region of the text, convert it uh, into computer understandable text uh, using uh, OCR, apply some sort of natural language processing, and convert it into any other language. So in retail stores, computer vision is being used for facial recognition where uh, then finding where usually shoppers spend more time. I mean, based on your age, based on your gender, based on your ethnicity, what kind of products uh, do you usually buy? So these uh, insights are very useful for the retail stores to actually place the models, place the uh, uh, different items. So I think uh, most of you might have heard about the Amazon Go stores. Uh, if not, I'll give you a brief on it. What you do is, basically, you enter the store, you pick an item from the aisle, and it is automatically added to your cart. No need to stand in the long queues like in Walmart or Spencer's or like Big Bazaars and D-Marts in India. And you simply walk out, and that money is uh, deducted from your Amazon account. It's actually a very good concept. Uh, then comes uh, sports. Uh, computer vision and deep learning is being extensively applied in sports analytics. There is a huge opportunity for computer vision engineers to enter this field. As you can see, the images of pose uh, analysis, where you are analyzing uh, the pose of uh, the analyzing the pose of every individual player, whether they are doing it right, whether they are doing it uh, wrong. Then you track the ball. Uh, you uh, do player recognition and tracking. So all kinds sorts of analysis that can be done using uh, the same. So uh, to give you an example, uh, <clears throat> like in cricket, uh, we can analyze how often does one player goes for a cover drive when the ball is pitched outside, uh, uh, outside off, I mean outside the stumps. And how often does a, a tennis player prefers a backhand shot? So we have different uh, applications that can be, uh, we have different analysis that can be performed using uh, the uh, style, I mean, the pose analysis, the ball tracking, the player recognition, etc. Then, uh, pose this, we have uh, self driving cars, advanced driver assistance systems. Everyone is aware, I won't. Uh, 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 I won't take much of a time in this part of uh, the deep learning and computer vision aspect. Uh, here you involve object detection, tracking, distance estimation, and a lot of things. For ADAS, uh, you will ADAS is advanced driver assistance systems. Uh, you will come across applications like uh, uh, driver attentiveness monitoring, parking assist systems. So there are multitudes of sensors like LIDARs, and uh, other sensors involved in uh, a self-driving car or uh, advanced cars. But camera is one of the very important one. So if you see this image, uh, deep learning is being extensively used uh, to get the driver attentiveness monitoring, on-road object detection uh, for safe driving, then uh, traffic sign recognition. Suppose you are not looking at the traffic sign, the uh, dashboard directly prompts you that it's red and you have to stop. Then uh, other part would be if your, uh, everyone has seen the parking assist systems where uh, it provides you a pathway to park or reverse park the vehicle. So uh, this is the industry where uh, the most glamour part comes in, the ADARs and the self-driving cars. Then it, uh, computer vision is also being used in agri-tech. By agri-tech mean uh, uh, tech, uh, agricultural uh, technology like uh, monitoring plant health. Uh, what's the state of your soil? Then is there any unwanted weed growth? So along with the deep learning and advanced analytics, it is being used to increase the yield of the farmers, which is very important uh, the, given the current state that we are in. And a lot of companies in India too are working for this uh, cause. Post uh, Agritech, uh, we have um, medical imaging. I guess everyone uh, is aware of, I mean, everyone is uh, completely drowned 
with the uh, coronavirus care and it's really scary so uh, if you have also seen a lot of companies that are coming up uh, i mean uh, like alibaba who have analyzed mri scans of our lungs and they are directly predicting whether uh, we are infected with coronavirus or not that is one case then uh, such a system was already being used to uh, analyze whether we have pneumonia what kind of pneumonia do we have in our lungs uh then if you see the image here this is for uh, uh, <coughs> uh the, the bottom uh, second one in the towards the left so this is for a retinal scan where we are analyzing whether the person has diabetes or not uh then uh, we can detect tumors we can detect cancerous elements in the uh, different scan so this industry requires the most precise and accurate results from computer vision or deep learning since the stake is so high the payout again is extremely high <clears throat> once we go up with uh, medical imaging uh, we have satellite imagery uh, in satellite imagery computer vision is helping in detecting and monitoring objects such as houses roads uh, different water bodies agricultural areas etc and there was also a recent competition to analyze the extent of hurricanes uh, the uh, and floods have caused the havoc uh, using the before and after satellite images so such competitions to keep coming and you can also participate uh, in those competitions they have very good prize monies too uh, then uh, <clears throat> if you remember uh, the movie i mean indians were do the movie called as uri where they mention the use of locating terrorist hideouts uh, approximate location using satellite image processing and so uh, and for the same they used a drone to manually find, point out the region so a lot of computer vision and deep learning is definitely involved in uh, such a thing <clears throat> so uh, on the left you see an aerial image on the right you see a map this is the normal google map that we uh, see uh in our day to day lives so it's very difficult to actually manually do this if someone sits and does that uh, using a uh, annotation tool or a, a i mean manually annotate things so using deep learning basically generative adversarial networks gans uh, this can be very easily automated and uh, uh, if you want to look up more on this you can search for cycle gans that are uh, actually being used uh, for the same so security and surveillance as i mentioned earlier to covers home security border patrolling surveillance and cra uh, crowded spots lot of things like uh, now if uh, people i mean uh, if we want to monitor our entire nation uh, using the place security cameras whether someone is uh, whether people are gathering mo more than four or five people are gathering at one spot we can do that uh, so computer vision involves multiple aspects here like intruder detection inside your houses uh locating unattended objects uh, such as bags in railway station airports analyzing crowd behavior whether they would move into cha chaotic scenarios or not then uh, tra detecting tracing vehicles criminal detection in crowd also suspicious behavior analysis whether there will be uh, a fight uh, that could break up in a crowded scene theft robbery and different so this industry has a lot of appli uh, sub domain applications involved in it pose that uh, the work which all of us love the most social media and it's filled with images and videos so uh, computer vision here comes into play when you are applying different filters or enhancers or instagram uh, same with snapchat filters uh, i also remember a very famous app that came across uh, the aging app the face app that would age you uh, uh, i mean in a positive sense and a negative sense and uh, so these all involve uh, your computer vision and deep learning filters like uh, applying fake beard gender swap changing hairstyles all these are involved in uh, computer vision and deep learning uh, i mean these are involved with computer vision and deep learning then your image uh, editing softwares uh, uh, photoshop uh, microsoft paint or any other software you take up uses lot of image processing and computer vision algorithms 
like uh, the one where you uh, change uh, the background where you remove the background uses a very uh, famous algorithm called as grab cut image segmentation you can have a look at it uh, later or you can contact us for the same <clears throat> after this uh, uh, the graphics and vfx industry is using again uh, is relying again on lot of uh, deep learning and computer vision so the increasing trend of uh, vfx for realistic features in movies uh th these involve high end video editing softwares and all of these rely on image processing so again the uh, very famous character thanos from uh, avengers infinity war uh, a lot of image processing and computer vision and uh, ar and we are involved in uh, generating this character so talking about ar and vr i guess everyone is amused and uh talks about these these days so augmented reality virtual reality that is growing very rapidly uh recently it has been it is being used for virtual home design uh then uh, i mean uh, in virtual home design uh, it actually lets you see all the furnitures all the uh, furnished equipments in an empty house where you can uh, visualize change things in a very realistic manner i mean before buying things if you could do that that's a great thing then you also have virtual conferencing uh, which involves uh, uh, in, uh, people at different places and uh, con uh, talking to each other feeling like uh, they are at the same office so these are uh, uh, some i mean the current slide is about some recent innovations that have come in the gans that we talk about converting an uh, image of zebra and making it a horse or converting uh, a picture that would look how it would look in summer to something in winter so uh, these are like realistic instagram filters you can uh, think about in that way then another uh, very famous uh, application that came uh, into the picture was deep fakes where <coughs> where uh, i'm sorry for that uh, <clears throat> where light portraits are being uh, made to talk like this mona lisa painting people uh, used gan to uh, make her talk and it was looking very realistic then there are deep fakes uh, uh, in a way that can make you actually dance so uh, have a look at this uh, mona lisa <laughs> talking actually So another one uh, that came uh, like this was everybody can dance now <laughs> and uh, that was like uh, you take someone else's dance and impose that dance on a standing picture of an individual uh, we'll share this link of uh, the video uh, <coughs> very soon so uh, how it worked this the person uh, we took a dance picture i mean not we i mean uh, the person who created it uh, uh, took a dance picture the person someone dancing and uh, there was a standing picture of uh, the target the person who was made to dance and this uh, uh, original dance was uh, imposed on uh, the target again uh, very important uh, innovation is uh, using sketches of criminals to predict how the person would look in real life so if you see in the left there is an input sketch the middle one is the output as to seeing how that person would actually look in real life and the third picture is how he actually looks in real life so you, it's very easy to catch you uh, criminals using uh, <coughs> a realistic uh, pick rather than a sketch so i guess this list will go on and on and so no point mentioning these uh, any further and if you google search it you will find different uh, innovations and applications that are coming every day so a uh, very quick re recap uh, in computer vision we have image classification object detection uh, image segmentation 
uh, face recognition, text recognition, activity analysis, video analytics, and whatnot. But for this series, today and tomorrow, we'll stick with image classification and object detection. And we'll also try out uh, different examples using uh, the same. <clears throat> so I guess uh, we can start with uh, image classification. So uh, I would like to get some comments on uh, how uh, do you guys feel as to uh, uh, how, I mean, uh, if you understand how big the industry is and is this interesting or not, something on the comment. And Akash, if you are there, if you would like to add a few things uh, so that, uh, and pose that we can start with the work. Yeah, I mean, uh, we would love to know what kind of image classification applications have, have our audience built and work towards. Yeah. Okay, so people are feeling that uh, it's a interesting space and... <coughs> uh, <coughs> Like, uh, they would I mean, be willing to explore more. Most of our audience have been asking what kind of applications can be built in domain X, Y, Z. And yeah. uh, just to clarify a few things and then numb down the expectations a little bit. Uh, so there are two sides of doing you know, uh, this, this whole ecosystem of this topic. On one end, there is, there is a developer side, the developer's perspective or point of view wherein you look at algorithms or solutions and approaches to how to tackle a particular problem. Uh, on the other hand, there is a commercial end to it where you know business leaders and people require applications to ease their lives or automate a particular work. Uh, now, if, if you want to start out with this approach of thinking of an application, I would say you would be, you know, a little short-sighted. That, that would be like, you know, start you know, opening a company and then thinking of a startup idea to go to. Uh, rather than doing that, uh, I would rather suggest, you know, to all of our audience is, is that become become a domain expert in a particular imaging modality or, uh, you know, an image capturing device. So, for example, if, you, if you're trying to work with medical imagery or, or medical imaging devices, uh, just, just get to know the ins and outs of what kind of, you know, noises that exist within the device, what kind of uh, you know, diagnostic analytics can you do? Is there a, you know, global sense of direction within the imagery being captured or not? And then try and, you know, determine algorithms that can be applied. So, for example, how can classification be applied to, say, you know, CT scans or X-ray imagery being captured? Or how detection can be applied to the topic of medical imagery? And then, you know, go out how, how to, you know, build applications around it, something that can help doctors or nurses or medical workers. So something that we are also working towards is, is uh, you know, creating X-ray scans and chest CT scans into different levels of pneumonia and lung effects. Something that that you know helps a lot of hospitals de determining coronavirus patients. Um, uh, and a lot of a lot of companies are trying to do this in today's age. And yeah, we will we'll delve deeper into this uh, once once I I start with them. Sorry to, for the interruption, Abhishek. Sure, Akash. Uh, I guess also uh, there's some uh, issue with uh, the, your voice. Uh, there's a static uh, noise behind that. All right, all right. I'll, I'll rectify that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay then. Uh, I'll also uh, request the volunteers to uh, share uh, the link for uh, uh, the slides, as a lot of people are requesting the same. And let's continue with uh, the actual work, the actual coding work. Okay. So image classification. Uh, image classification is simply put a process of attaching a label to a query image. Like if you have an image, uh, like here, uh, an aeroplane, you uh, attach a tag of airplane. You take a bird, you attach a tag of bird. So this automation is done by uh, uh, the system. The most used processes here are, is actually, most used process here is actually transfer learning which we will go through in detail completely. But in short, I'll explain it. 
So transfer learning is like you take an AI engine, a neural network that has been trained on a very large image data set, but doesn't know how to classify your images. Like if you have a cat versus dog data set, it doesn't know how to classify your images. So the you go ahead and tweak it so that it learns about your custom data. And that is exactly what is transfer learning. You are uh, basically transferring uh, the features of your data and making the network learn. Another way to uh, tackle image classification problem is creating your own custom neural network and training that from scratch. So we'll tackle both these problems in our series. And uh, for the same, let me introduce uh, to all of you our library, uh, Monk AI. Uh, we'll first start with the Monk image classification suit, which is uh, so, <clears throat> which is like a very syntax invariant, unified, and a simple deep learning framework. I'll don't worry about these terms. We'll come to them. So, Monk is like it's it's on its way to become a complete computer vision and deep learning toolkit. Uh, we created that for our in-house work and later we open sourced it. It is designed to actually standardize the deep learning and computer vision workflows. And uh, so what these workflows are, uh, if you understand, uh, then we can definitely uh, move ahead and uh, see what syntax invariance and a unified wrapper, all these terms mean. So I guess uh, a lot of you might have already uh, worked in deep learning or computer vision space. Some are starting out, some are uh, just understanding the thing. So for them, uh, a computer vision uh, framework or a computer vision process involves these steps. Uh, I guess it's yet to load. Yeah, it's loaded. <coughs> so computer vision involves these steps and uh, these are I'll go one by one data collection where we'll take a simple example of cats versus dog classifier. You want to identify whether an image contains a cat or not, where now you take an effort of collecting or collating an image data set. It could be like scraping off from Internet or you already have images or contacting organizations when it comes to satellite and medical data. Then you label you manually attach a label to each of these images. Uh, uh, whether it's a cat or whether it's a dog, uh, things like that. Then you select a framework. A framework is a deep learning framework. Like uh, we have different uh, uh, <coughs> frame, uh, frameworks uh, like PyTorch, Keras, MXNet, which one to choose. Once you choose that, you select an algorithm. If it's an uh, object detection, uh, should you uh, go for YOLO v3 or SSD, a lot of algorithms exist. If it's image classification, you try to understand whether to use ResNet, whether to use DenseNet. A lot of algorithms exist in this place. Then you optimize your model. I mean, uh, you want to deploy that model somewhere on cloud or somewhere like Raspberry Pi or NVIDIA Jetson board. So you optimize your model accordingly. And finally, you deploy the model. So for this series, our focus is on framework selection, algorithm selection, and training. That's it. Three things. We'll keep it simple. So let's uh, annotation. Uh, when it comes to annotation, it's uh, like you are providing a label, a tag on it, whether it's a cat or a dog. It's very simply put. Or uh, you are also uh, uh, mentioning uh, where the bounding box of uh, where the uh, object is inside the image, like the bounding boxes. Or you are semantically segmenting an image where you are using polygons. A lot of things come here. So again, uh, our focus is on framework selection, algorithmic selection, and <coughs> and uh, training. So if you actually go and search for uh, in the internet about uh, what uh, different tools exist on uh, for computer vision, deep learning, so you have like an innumerable set of tools like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Keras. MXNet, CAFE, CAFE2, uh, Deep Learning for Java, Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, Intel Toolkit, a lot and lot of things. And then comes the computer vision, the image processing side. Too many libraries there too, like OpenCV, Python Pillow. And for mathematics, you have Scikit-learn, Open, uh, 
sci-fi. I mean, it's very difficult to actually choose which library will work for you and uh, how you should go ahead and select that. It's uh, the same for beginners. It's the same for experts as well. So if you uh, go ahead and simply search for for items like uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch on the Google search window, you'll get so many mixed views and opinions that it will completely overwhelm you. And a lot of you uh, might be taking in online courses or MOOCs, and they only teach either one of these libraries. Like uh, they either teach uh, PyTorch or they either teach Keras. So how do you select these? How do you select from these libraries? How do you actually go about and uh, uh, pick one as to uh, whether uh, PyTorch is the best one for me or the Keras is the best one for me? And the biggest hurdle that comes here is that the syntax of these libraries. Uh, let that video load. I'll show you an example for the same. This lag is creating some trouble for me to actually sync both the things. <coughs> Yeah, uh, just let me know once the video is visible. Uh, Akash? Yeah, it, it is visible. Okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, when the video starts, uh, the very first thing that we uh, look at it is a Keras notebook. Uh, Keras code, where you have to write so many lines of codes. And if you do the same uh, with PyTorch, you have to write again those many lines of code. My bad, guys. I guess this the sync is causing a certain issue to help me demo it. I'll explain it verbally. Uh, I'll uh, share these videos too, where uh, if you see the syntax of Keras and if you see the syntax of PyTorch, you will uh, know the difference that uh, how uh, difficult it is to actually learn these libraries. I can uh, search for you the same, a code, a basic code. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sharing those two codes with you guys. Have a look at them. So I have commented the codes uh, in the section there. And you can go ahead and have a look at those sections, those codes, where you will understand how different these syntaxes are. And later we came to know about, uh, we started, I mean, when we started coding, we uh, felt there was a need to have a common syntax for all the uh, libraries. Like uh, if you have, if you remember, Keras is a uh, unified wrapper uh, of over TensorFlow and Theano. Similar way, 
Monk is a syntax invariant wrapper over uh, all the major deep learning frameworks. By syntax invariant, I mean you write the same code, the same set of code for uh, using either PyTorch or using Keras, and you change only one line of it. So we'll get to that uh, very soon. Post that, we go up with uh, algorithmic selection. So when it comes to algorithms, you have to search for a lot of uh, neural networks. You have to search for a lot of hyperparameters, the losses, the optimizers, the data augmentation functions, too many things to consider. Like uh, there are so many neural networks in deep learning itself, AlexNet, ResNet, DenseNet, EfficientNet, MobileNet. On top of it, they have internal versions like ResNet version 1, ResNet version 2, ResNet 50, ResNet 152. So all these things create a lot of chaos in the mind of a developer as to which one to choose. Then every model has its own parameters to change, whether to use a pre-trained model, how to initialize the network. I'm not trying to overwhelm you guys. I'm trying to make you understand as to how uh different how many uh, how different uh how many different parameters you have to tweak how many different knobs you have to uh, uh manage that will improve the accuracy if you see this image uh from the bottom to top uh, the accuracy creeps uh, kept increasing so this is one of the hacker earth competitions that we participated in and uh, we tried changing each and every uh, <coughs> knob of or you can say every parameter of deep learning that helped us actually gain uh, and understand uh, the accuracies. Also, as someone has mentioned, it also depends on the organization and the team and the business that you're working with, how to choose these algorithms or how to choose these, um, I, I guess Akash has mentioned, yeah. So how to choose these um, uh, different frameworks. So yes, uh, all these choices make a lot of issue uh, make a lot of learning issues uh, create a lot of learning issues for the developer because he has to learn pytorch he has to learn keras he has to learn mxnet you never know what a client would ask <clears throat> so for this uh, we created our monk tools here you will see how easy it is to uh, actually create an application where we have three different modes for our tools one is a quick mode for beginners. The second is an intermediate mode where you get access to all the knobs that exist in the uh, application. And the third is a uh, expert mode. So is this uh, screen uh, and the code visible to everyone? Abhishek, there is a slight lag. Uh, you could just take a 20 second gap. Oh, it, uh, the lag is that big. Yeah. Uh, can uh, GDG help us resolve this uh, right now? OK, I guess uh, by now it will be visible. Uh, in the very first line, you see we are importing a framework from Gluon prototype, or it could be from PyTorch prototype, or it could be TensorFlow prototype or Keras prototype. After that, it is all the same for every uh, deep learning uh, application. In four lines of code, you can actually create a complete deep learning uh, and image classification application. The second mode that we have uh, after this is an intermediate mode. Uh, in the intermediate mode, what we uh, allow uh, uh, people is we give them access to all the different parameters, the hyperparameters, the models, uh, the optimizers, the loss functions. You name it and you will have an update function for the same. So how an uh, engineer goes about it is uh, you load the experiment in the default mode and you keep uh, updating a parameter one by one. And then you can also compare the results uh, 
suppose you are changing a neural network uh, archi- suppose you are changing a learning rate from 0.1 to 0.01 uh, you will be able to graphically visualize which one worked better for you for that uh, we also have <coughs> a tutorial a short tutorial on that where you can actually see again i guess it will be difficult for us to uh, explain things with the lag <coughs> yeah i guess it's loaded uh, now onto your screens the notebook where in this example we are doing two things uh, we are taking a network and we are applying transfer learning and we are uh, in the second part we are not applying transfer learning we are training the network from scratch and uh, don't worry about the code right now it will be uh, all these notebooks will be shared with you so that you can try it on your own <coughs> and as you can see graphs uh, in we have a comparison uh, uh, comparison mode where <clears throat> you will be able to actually compare uh, whether uh, a transfer learning works for you or uh, uh, using the network or using the uh, or training the network from scratch works for you different graphs and uh, post uh, in the end you can actually uh, analyze and check uh, which one i mean uh, which option which knob or which uh, value of the knob actually worked for you uh, i guess it's visible now so in all our notebooks we also uh, give you suggestions as to which one which uh, parameter uh, is the uh, one working best for you post this uh, we have an expert mode where we allow all our uh, we allow to create an experiment from scratch i mean basic uh, industry experts usually require uh to set up their experiment to set all the parameters all by themselves so our monk also has an expert mode attached to it <coughs> have a look at uh the video so uh, what i'm highlighting is right now uh, the different parameters the different uh, 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 model changes the optimizes uh, everything that is being set by a uh, user for non coders we have a graphical user interface too so that the person who wants to learn deep learning but uh, isn't aware of uh, much of isn't uh, much into coding or uh, isn't much into python programming can start learning deep learning and um, uh, computer vision using our graphical tool where they set all the parameters that are being set by, by a coder using the python code uh, that person can do that uh, using our graphical user interface <coughs> so just a quick recap our monk classification uh, tool is a unified wrapper and its syntax invariant meaning you write the same code for pytorch you write the same code for keras you write the same code for tensorflow and uh, it will pro, uh, it will be like you are using all those uh, uh, frameworks natively so no need to learn all these syntaxes you only learn monk learn one language learn uh, uh, a single syntax and you are good to go then uh as a programmer you do a lot of experiments so uh and you don't have a uh, way to keep track of those experiments like a kaggle expert or a, a competitive programming expert usually uh, carries out around 400 to 500 experiments to reach that top position how does one know what uh, parameters were set in the say 15th experiment or say the 31st experiment 
So we have a complete project management system in Monk uh, where you all these parameters are stored in a single location and you can reproduce and go back to those experiments as well as you can compare whether uh, your 31st experiment uh, compare your 31st experiment with say your 300th experiment and see all the changes that you made uh, resulted in better accuracy or not so no other uh, uh, framework at this point uh, as of uh, as i mean as per our knowledge provides you with so many uh, features akash will talk about all these features uh, i mean in more comprehensive manner so i guess you get a very uh, good idea about the classification part the second part that comes uh, is object detection in object detection along with identifying that there is a cat in the image you also identify where that cat exactly is in that image <coughs> and when you are actually uh, trying to localize this object there could be multiple objects in that same image so this is the second part of our uh, work now when you uh, start uh, looking for algorithms or different ways for object detection you will see uh, in the uh, google search or your github search that there are so many algorithms like if you go ahead and search for uh, vehicle detection deep learning try that on your browser and go till the 10th page you will still find an algorithm that is different from the one in the first page so people don't have idea as to how to go uh, and uh, work with these algorithms then uh, comes the issue of all these algorithms are written by some uh, a different developer and uh, th that developer writes that code uh, in someone uh, might write that code in uh, and you say uh, python someone might, uh, might write that code in uh, tensorflow so all these things create a lot of chaos and installation issues when you are actually trying to implement them if you are act, uh, a developer you would know that it would it takes around 4 5 hours to actually understand someone's code and then install it on your system so 4 5 hours is a, a lot of time wasted when you are doing uh, an r and d work uh then uh again talking about r and d uh, you go uh, and check for the best algorithms and <clears throat> uh, you try to actually understand how these algorithms uh, are benchmarked again against each other like an uh, yolo uh, algorithm would be like on 80% accuracy and uh, uh, ssd algorithm might be on 60% accuracy just a, a crude example and these accuracies are on some other data now Uh, if you go ahead with that and check on your data it might be possible that the lower accurate one would be working better for you so there are so many things to consider and uh, so many complexities involved uh, and i think uh, this video i'll start and <clears throat> and you will be able to uh, see that uh, video soon where a very same algorithm ssd single shot multi box algorithm is written in multiple ways uh, in keras in pytorch if you actually go and search ssd pytorch you will get 15 to 20 more variants by 15 to 20 more developers you don't know which one to choose which one will actually get installed in your system so for this for this uh, what we uh, tried is creating a single place a pool where all these algorithms are uh, at, uh in are set up in a way that you can take them install them in one single step and start running it you can also compare different uh, experiments uh, uh, along the way like you want to check whether yolo uh, works better for you or ssd or rcnn uh, works better for you so all these things uh, you can check with our monk object detection library have a uh, look uh, look at all these tweets by famous deep learning engineers uh, where they are expressing their grief on how difficult it is to actually debug a deep learning library or a deep learning algorithm
just give a couple of minutes to read them so that i can uh, in the meantime load <coughs> the libraries for you okay so the first one is the monk classification library where you have detailed documentations detailed uh, examples more than 100 to uh, 120 jupyter notebooks that are uh, we are still adding them uh, we are still uh, adding more notebooks to them there is a complete documentation uh, and <clears throat> getting started roadmap tutorials suppose that uh, we have the object detection library i'll wait for it to load So this is the object detection library. If you, uh, if I scroll down and uh, show you, there are so many pipelines that we have made it uh, easily installable and low code for you. Like you write four lines of code, and uh, <clears throat> you are able to actually uh, uh, train a complete uh, object detector that would initially required uh, 20 to 30 lines of codes. So we'll provide you with the links for these and you'll be able to uh, check them further. Uh, as I want to emphasize more on us, more on this, we have an application bank where there are multiple notebooks on how to create different applications. And there are uh, alongside that, uh, there are uh, Jupyter notebooks attached. There are even blogs on these applications. We'll uh, share all the links with you as to how uh, the different applications are and how they work. <clears throat> so I guess uh, we can start uh, with a general uh, introduction as to how to code your first image classifier. Uh, before this, uh, uh, if anybody has any doubts, you can shoot them up and uh, on the comment section and Akash and others will be able to help you there. Also, I would like to know your opinion on uh, how do you feel about this basic introduction to Monk libraries? So we'll be taking all the tutorials on Google Colab that provides you with a free uh, GPU and allows you to uh, run all the experiments. In some time, we'll also share uh, the links to all our uh, tutorials that uh, Akash will be taking. So uh, Mayank has asked uh, how much of mathematics or deep learning and neural networks is required. Yes, uh, you do require mathematics and uh, uh, the algorithmic overview of things, but you can still start creating applications uh, and trying out different uh, experiments using Mong tool so that uh, it's a simultaneous process actually. You learn, uh, applic uh, you create the application you see the effect of uh, the parameter and you learn the theory of that parameter alongside. I don't think any other uh, library provides you uh, such a good uh, simultaneous competition. And uh, Nisarg, yes, Monk is open source. Okay. Uh, so I'll uh, request everyone to have a look at the steps that we are doing and still keep uh, asking questions, no issues with that. So first, 
if you take any uh, jupyter notebook of ours there will be an option to open in collab uh once it loads i'll be able to help you with that yeah so now as you can see there is an open in collab option <clears throat> And uh, once you click on that, it will open a collaboratory uh, co Google Collab notebook. Uh, in, the, in that, first thing you need to do is change the runtime to GPU. Basically, you are using an accelerated hardware uh, to run these experiments. Uh, the training will be very faster. The inference will even be faster. The first step is to clone the library. It asks for a certain corrections. Yes, I'm definitely not a robot. The second thing, once you have uh, um, cloned the library, is to install it. We have a specific Colab installation in installation directory miscellaneous folder, which you can install it using one single line, pip install minus r requirements underscore Colab dot txt. So since this is the very first tutorial, I'm taking it uh, very slowly and uh, post these, Akash will be able to uh, <clears throat> run all the experiments quite quickly. So uh, it installs all the libraries in the collab environment and then we import it. So at present, uh, it is importing all the uh, MXNet libraries as well as uh, associated libraries uh, in Python uh, that were actually used, that we will actually use uh, in our experiment. Okay. <clears throat> Let me talk about uh, experiment a little. So there are two things involved here. One is a project, one is an experiment. You create a project for a, a sing, one single type of data. Like uh, if you have a cat versus dog classifier, you create a single project. Inside that, you have multiple experiments attached to it, uh, where you can uh, use one type of network for uh, in experiment one and another type in experiment two. <clears throat> then it creates a workspace folder for you. Um, guys, can we share the GitHub link uh, with everyone? Yeah. So uh, as you can see, it, this is the folder structure that is created for you automatically. There's a workspace, there's a project that you have created. And in that project, there are multiple experiments attached to it. Now we have created only one experiment where this experiment folder stores all the logs of whatever you did with that experiment and all the models that are model weights that uh, are uh, saved uh, post that experiment. OK, so let's try it. This is created. Uh, we'll load in some time. Uh, 
uh, those who are unable to find uh, the uh, notebook in the chat section, simply search for monk underscore version one v one in uh, GitHub. Go to uh, the study roadmaps and start with the getting started tutorial. Okay, now as you can see, once you have uh, created a prototype experiment like sample project one and sample experiment one. Uh, you'll be uh, the folders will be uh, created directly. Now, our goal is to load the data set as well as set all the parameters as well as set select the models in one go. Don't worry about the data set. Don't worry about the model. Don't worry about any hyperparameters. Uh, you can simply run this, and you will be able to understand what exactly is happening. So there, the default state is for the uh, beginners or uh, for the intermediate mode, where you load the data set and uh, it starts uh, loading the model, the downloading the weights. And it prints a very beautiful summary of what all parameters were set. I would request every one of you to Spend some time and understand what these parameters are. Just have a look at it. Akash will take uh, full care. Uh, Akash will make you uh, understand all these parameters. In one line, I loaded all the uh, models, all the hyperparameters, all uh, the entire data in one single line. And then I started the training. Training again prints all the necessary details that you need to know. If you will see, since we are using the GPU, it trained very quickly and it's a very small data set. Just for example, now I want to understand how uh, my uh, uh, network has learned things. So I reload the experiment and try to run it on a separate data set to uh, uh, understand how accurate it is. So we are getting around 94% accuracy for a cat versus dog classifier. I can also run this on individual images. So if I run this on individual images, I'll get to know that the <clears throat> when it's a cat, when the loaded image is cat, it predicts the classifier as cat. And when the loaded image is dog, it predicts it as dog. Very easy. And uh, it's like in five minutes here, even with the lag, I was able to create a classifier with no hustles, with just four lines of code. I was able to infer it on a complete new data set. I was also able to infer it on uh, individual images. So using these low code tools, you will be doing a lot of experiments uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, the <clears throat> uh, ones that we would like to focus on uh, would be the object detection and the image classification one. Uh, I would request you to try this collab experiment once so that we can very smoothly continue for the rest of uh, the tutorial today. Uh, to brief, uh, briefly mention about the experiments that we'll try, malaria cell classification, blood cell type classification, classifying what type of weather it is in the image, uh, chest x-ray analysis, architectural heritage site classification. On the object detection side, we'll demo out weapon detection, detection in low lighting conditions, uh, logo uh, 
detector, people detector, animal detector. So I guess uh, while you are trying this, I'll uh, do a very quick recap. Our Monk has three libraries, Monk image classification, Monk object detection, and Monk uh, uh, graphical user interface. The first one, just I demoed you as to how easy it is in the beginner mode. Uh, the update modes are again uh, similarly very easy. The second uh, is uh, the second one is um, uh, object detection library where you get to create, uh, install and create applications in just like uh, four or five lines of codes uh, rather than using 30 to 40 lines. And uh, the graphical user interface is a GUI on top of this. Uh, so I think uh, Akash, you can take it up from here and uh, start explaining uh, the different uh, uh, <coughs> uh, start going through all the different notebooks and uh, yeah and here we check uh, given that it's 12 40 already uh, i'll say i'll take the next 15 minutes with the brushing to no uh, akash i think we can extend it no issues with that um, just, just for the sake of the audience, uh, I would say rather than going through the entire set of notebooks, uh, I'll, I'll okay. rush through the notebooks and give the audience a chance to go back home, try them out in Tola, and maybe come back tomorrow again where we dive deeper into sure. how to go about building applications. Sure, sure. Uh, okay, so let's ask the audience themselves. Uh, yeah, I. Yeah, yeah. Or we like to go through the details of the notebook too. Just let us know in the comments. Mohammed, the, the data set, the sample data set is in the library itself. And uh, post that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, for the next, uh, for <clears throat> yeah, to answer Mohammed, uh, the sample, uh, uh, this is the sample data set. Uh, the next ones will uh, let you know the links from where you can download. So Vedant is okay with extending. So, uh, Mayank, uh, how to map? Mayank has a question on how to map uh, to GitHub for practice. So, uh, you can traverse uh, to the GitHub links that uh, our volunteers are sharing and open them on Collab or uh, download the notebooks and run them on your own local system if you have a GPU.
Yeah, Akash, I think it's better now. The static is in there. Hello. 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 So uh, Vivek has a question, how it, is it uh, good for high-end research compared to Keras? Uh, so uh, Vivek, hmm. all the things that you can do in Keras can now be done uh, with Monk's version of Keras and with easier hmm. code. Hey guys. I wish you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, it's better now. Uh, guys, can you confirm as to uh, whether we can uh, uh, take the lecture forward and start with the examples? Okay then, uh, so let's uh, take it forward and Akash. Uh, all right, hey everyone. Up. Hope all of you are uh, safe and sound with your families uh, and back at home. Uh, to those who are not at home, I hope you're you know trying to learn something new, building and honing your skill set, and are healthy. Um, so like Abhishek has explained a lot how the domains of image processing have been in existence for a while now. And, you know, since, since the days of when, you know, media or capturing elements have existed, capturing devices have existed. And since the days when media or images and videos have to be stored, processed or transmitted, uh, image processing algorithms have been in picture and application from, you know, compressing images to, you know, noise removal as an application. Um, now that very field since since the 90s has expanded into the topic of computer vision where you know as as intelligent species we strive to you know build automated systems that inculcate algorithms that are intelligent and are you know closely resemble the human visual decision making skills so you know our, our day to day visual decision making skills require a lot of intelligence as you might have you know, seen examples within the autonomous or driverless cars example, where you know, given that driving itself is a very complex visual skill required, automating that again is a very tough task and people are still trying to crack that. We still have, you know, we still have to achieve level five autonomy in, in driverless cars, but yeah, we are, we are well onto the road to automating almost every visual decision making required. However, um, given that there is a lot of commercial application being built around computer vision, uh, if you look at imaging signals in particular, they are the most chaotic and have the highest entropy, right? So uh, I'm sure most of you have come across classification and detection algorithms trying to detect objects, detect or classify objects into one class or another and realize that, you know, uh, deep learning and machine learning algorithms still have to you know, get perfect or get accurate in, in certain cases, wherein they have achieved some baseline or, you know, better than human accuracies in certain cases. Now, given that there is a lot of chaos in the domain itself with the absence of processes and no standard development protocols in place. So just, just to give you an analogy, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, building smartphone applications today, they are, you know, 
very easy to do given that there are a set of standard methods and a set of standard tools that you go to to you know build smartphone applications and uh, i'm sure you know any one of you who takes up smartphone application building can do so within a week today however uh, like most of the audience today mentioned that you know getting into the space itself is a little tedious and thinking and imagining you know how to go about building applications becomes a cascaded hassle on the other end um in fact along the way having you know done a lot of freelancing work both me and abhishek in the domain of computer vision and you know applying deep learning algorithms to computer vision uh, we faced a lot of challenges and bottlenecks of a non standardized process i mean back in 2014 when facebook came up with its face recognition algorithm facenet abhishek and me you know were the first ones to pounce upon that network when it was released and uh, you know build a similar research for for you know while working with a startup out of italy to you know port facial recognition onto a headset for the blind um having you know seen the applications of deep learning and having seen you know commercial computer vision applications we started out with a services and consultancy business wherein we helped teams and businesses who did not have in house computer vision expertise we helped them design develop and deploy computer vision applications now since abhishek has mostly described till now what is required in you know building computer vision applications let me just quickly revise so you usually require a data set a large enough data set to build an efficient you know application second you need a computer vision algorithm a model or a heuristic or a workflow to say i mean like abhishek also described the challenges that a developer has to face there are more than one way to go about building a computer vision application right and you know since there are more than one algorithm to solve a single challenge a developer usually has to explore you know more than one approach and try to evaluate which one is the best for their purpose now you know running an organization this used to be a hassle for us and you know which is one of the reasons why we have you know a project creator and multiple experiment manager within our toolkit itself since that helped our developers a lot in streamlining their own you know work management and thereby helped us create solutions faster for our clients um along the way we realized that since the domain itself did not have any standard protocols or workflows around it and every library every you know widely used deep learning framework have their own set of nuances that each developer has to go through so rather than having to go through you know framework nuances we felt that you know having to just learn deep learning once and knowing the jargons that flow around within deep learning so you know uh, anyone who learns deep learning would understand what hyperparameter tuning is and what goes on to you know tuning hyperparameters be it optimizers or loss functions uh, you would have some standard jargons that you utilize what we try to do is wrap all these jargons into a low code syntax low code programming syntax and provide standard workflows so that you don't have you do not have to you know worry about another researcher's uh, you know traditional way of programming all you have to do is learn a single workflow and keep plug and play you know plugging different features updating different optimizers and parameters and you know go about evaluating performance of your approach on a particular data set um now now that i have explained that let's let's get on to some of the features that monk ai has to offer uh in the rest of today's time what i'll do is i'll quickly go through some of the elemental features what monk has to offer and how you can use monk tomorrow we'll go over some of you know the impacts of how you know go about tuning these hyperparameters and what impact does it have on your performance or the accuracy metrics that you want to track um let's begin
is is my screen visible to you guys just let me know uh abhishek i guess you would have to put my screen in the presenter as the presenter yeah i hope it is visible now All right. I guess it's visible now. Um, though there is a lag. Um, what I'll try to do is I'll, I'll switch screens and start speaking after a moment. All right. Um, so to describe uh, what we are trying to do and what's in store for everyone who's, who's following Monkey and who's following us. Um, we have, what we are trying to achieve here is, is achieve standardization in processes and workflows for computer vision engineers specifically. Um, if you look at applications of deep learning, deep learning can be applied to a lot of different signals. Like for example, someone mentioned stock markets as, as a source of signals and a source of data to apply machine learning and deep learning models to. Um, definitely one of the key areas, however, the you know algorithms and the heuristics changes when you switch domain or switch the type of signal you're working with. With Monk AI, our, our goal right now, in fact, uh, currently our total focus is, is working with imaging modalities. So right from satellite imaging modalities down to CCTV cameras, thermal, infrared, or in fact, also using LIDARs and drones as, as data capturing mechanisms down to you know microscopic slides, X-rays, MRIs, and CT scans in the medical imaging space. So given that computer vision and imaging modality sources are themselves broad, with each of the domains having their own you know, workflows and methods that can be applied, uh, we are trying to build workflows, quick, easy to use workflows for different topics and different domains within computer vision. And along with that, we are also working on building algorithms or integrating state-of-the-art algorithms from each of these you know, computer vision topics of interest. So we have you know, state-of-the-art image classification, state-of-the-art object detection libraries already integrated. We are also working towards you know, text detection, recognition, segmentation, and tracking algorithms that are you know, coming soon and will be there for your per user. Um, these are in the algorithm end. On the data end, we are working towards integrating you know, state-of-the-art open source data sets that are usually used to benchmark solutions. Um, so whenever you try and build state-of-the-art classification or detection or tracking algorithms, there are state-of-the-art data sets on which you carry out evaluations. So we are also working towards integrating you know, one single line integration of these data sets so you can evaluate your model performance on these data sets readily. On the deployment and inference end, we are working towards one-click deployment to cloud and embedded solutions. So that you can not just you know, deploy your models and infer and test your models on these platforms and cloud servers, but also benchmark your you know, solutions on both cloud GPUs and embedded systems like you know, neural compute sticks or Odroid and Raspberry Pis. Um, having said that, uh, let's, let's dive into the getting started roadmap.
I hope I have been clear till now. Let me know if if you have any queries or doubts. All right. Um, so as you can see, we have tried to delve into you know different types of roadmaps. Today we are doing the getting started roadmap. However, uh, for developers and programmers with little or no understanding of image processing and computer vision space, we also have an image processing roadmap wherein you can learn about the different image processing operations and functions in play, right? And also how to translate from image processing operators to deep learning operations and deep learning building blocks. So what are the state of the art deep learning building blocks today that are applied to computer vision algorithms and how to go about applying them? So we have all these tutorial notebooks in place for you know from an en entry level developer to an expert developer to both not just understand the practical implementation details but also understand the theoretical implementations of of these modules and blocks. Having said that, let's get back to you know getting started with Mom. Now, since Abhishek has already you know done a quick run through of setting up the library, loading a data set, uh, loading a model, and then inferring on a test image. I'll start out with some elemental features or key features that we felt are required and important for a computer vision developer to manage their uh, projects better. To start out with, the first feature was you know printing experiment summaries. Now, I guess Abhishek has previously mentioned this. You can open each of these notebooks from the roadmap section in Colab very easily. Just open one in Colab, you know, where if you want to follow through together, just open these notebook in Colab and load it up and connect to a working kernel, and you can follow it together. Now, the step one to you know managing or looking at any experiment is is finding out the summary, right? And to check out what kind of summary is printed, let, let's look at what an experiment summary will hold for us. So after having created a project and an experiment and setting up different data set, model, and project parameters, you can get a small description of what the project is. So you have your project details, you have your data set details too, including image paths, whether you have validation and test sets loaded or not. You have different data set parameters, which include image dimensions, batch sizes, the CPU processors you are using. So you can increase the number of CPU processors again, depending on the system you're working with, the number of classes that the data set has. Uh, moving on to the transformations that have been applied, uh, you can you know, keep a check of what kind of transformations are applied so that you know in case you have applied grayscale imaging to train and validation, you ensure that you also apply grayscale to your test set. In this case, it's not true though. Um, coming out to the model summary, uh, the model holds which uh, neural network architecture you are using, whether you have set GPU to be used or not, uh, whether you've decided to use pre-trained network or would you want to you know, randomly initialize your set of weights? And are those base weights frozen or not? So do you want to train those, uh, train the pre-trained model or do you want to just train the final layer during trans learning? Um, just to add on to this, uh, the image classification toolkit that we have, that's for transfer learning, yes, but that also allows you to build custom neural networks of your own. That is something that we'll be looking on to tomorrow and uh, you know how to go about building a custom neural network of your own and how to evaluate performance on that. Yeah, uh, moving on, uh, you can view the hyperparameters like we discussed. So as a deep learning engineer, there are certain knobs that you tween, or tweak or you know tune to achieve or improve accuracies. Now, there are strategies or default recommendations that, have, that are set in place by us while, while we were building these tutorials. However, uh, depending on the data in play and the problem you are trying to tackle, these are the hyperparameters that you, you know, tweak to achieve better 
performances. So the optimizer in play. So uh, there is a stochastic gradient descent in play here. Have you used what is the learning rate? Have you used momentum or weight decay? Some of the jargons that are widely used, you know, as deep learning strategies to improve or make our model, you know, more accurate. Um, is what what's the learning rate scheduler in play or what's the loss function in play? We'll be going over, you know, what each of these mean and how changing each of these impacts the accuracy of a model tomorrow itself. Uh, there are already, you know, notebooks that that are already in place where you can, you know, try and run them when you go back home today and see the effect that each of these parameters has. And we'll go over them briefly tomorrow too. Now that's that's that for project summary. Let's get to the second feature that we felt was really important. Um, so someone mentioned that training time is is a really critical aspect of of building a deep or applying deep learning model to any any data set. And we totally and completely agree with you. Uh, usually our training times for for our clients have run from you know a few days to weeks at length. Uh, running up to you know 100,000 epochs before we even got to you know baseline accuracies since the data sets were so huge. Um, one of the key features that we felt was really important and useful for us was doing a pause and resume. So whenever we are trying to train a model, uh, it usually happens that you know when we are running training on a local system, not on Colab, Kaggle, or a, you know GPU-based AWS instance or a GCP instance. What usually happens is uh, the entire resource of your local system is utilized. So the entire RAM, the entire graphics card, and the, all the cores of the CPU are utilized. And your system usually, you know, the older versions of your of your local compute bar usually, you know, used to hang, and you could not do anything else. Not even open up a new tab in a browser. Um, what that does is it, it takes up the entire local compute that you have, uh, making it useless. What we did as a first feature to begin with was add, you know, pause and resume capabilities to our experiments. So what you can do is you can initialize your entire experiment. So you set up Monk AI, you load the data set, right? Uh, next, you create an experiment. You load your image data set, you set the number of epochs, and choose the pre trained uh, neural network architecture that you want to utilize. You get a pretty print summary at the end when you load the data set. And when you're training, uh, suppose you want to you know, just take a break at the fifth epoch or, or the tenth epoch and uh, you know, realize that you want to maybe change models or look up something on your browser, you can pause your training at the tenth epoch. And with Monk, what you can do is you can reload the same experiment while setting the resume train flag to be true. And it helps you resume training from the 10th epoch itself. So as you can see, it, it resumes experiment from the 10th epoch. So suppose you are running an experiment for, you know, say 500 epochs, and you want to take a break or pause the experiment at the 200th epoch, you can do so. And it resumes from the last known you know, resume point. Um, moving on to the next feature, uh, well, compare experiment was something that we really needed. In fact, almost every developer requires to evaluate which approach or which algorithm, which pre-trained model, or which neural network architecture kind of worked the best for them and you know solves their purpose. Um, so to compare experiment. So if, if you look at Monk, there are primarily four modes of operation. The first being the training mode, wherein you take a data set and you train a computer vision model. The second being evaluation or infer mode, um, wherein you evaluate on a test data set or a validation data set. Now, evaluation and infer mode are pretty much the same. However, uh, during inference, you want to either evaluate on a test data set or, you know, Whereas during evaluation, you would want to evaluate on a validation data set. Um, these are pretty much dependent on, on the developer's uh, approach and the way the problem that they are tackling. Um, given if you have validated validation data set, you usually do carry out an evaluation on the validation data set. 
However, when you're trying to compare experiments, you compare them across different parameters. Let's check out which parameters do we compare on. So in the notebook, what we've done is we've created three different experiments using three different uh, neural network architectures. And ultimately, what we do is we import the compare module and we create a sample comparison project. Now, like I mentioned, comparison in itself is a new mode wherein you create a comparison project. Uh, you add the experiments that you want to compare. So you select the project name and the experiment name you want to compare different experiments with. And these, these are the metrics which are compared and evaluated across the different experiments. So you have you know, validation performance, you have benchmarks such as GPU usage and training time to compare which one is faster, both in training and perform, you know, inference. You compare across accuracies and losses for both training and validation test sets. Some pretty plots are generated and you can you know, visualize which experiment fared, fared the best for you. So as you can see, uh, MobileNet in this case, has has the best training performance. However, it, it's just trained for you know five epochs, and we can see that you know DenseNet is is going up, and if we train for more epochs, maybe DenseNets would outperform the mobile nets. Uh, as as deep learning engineers, this is something that we observe and resume training from. Moving on, uh, so so for compare features, we not just have compare features for experiments that you compared, you know, created for, for a single framework, but you can compare experiments across different backend frameworks too. So for example, if you have created one model using PyTorch, another model using MXNet, and third model using Keras, you can compare model performances both in benchmarks of GPU usage and training time, and also training and validation losses too. So you can ultimately find out which framework also works best for the data set in play. So like you can see, uh, the backend neural network used here was the same. However, we have for the different libraries, um, Keras performs, outperforms the other two. However, if you if you look at you know PyTorch's performance, PyTorch was going up and if you train for more epochs, maybe PyTorch outperforms Keras in, in performance. Something that, that we observe as, as developers, right? Um, yeah, so you can compare not just you know experiments within a single project, but also experiments across different frameworks and different projects altogether. Um, coming on to the modes, like I described, there are not four but three modes here: uh, the training mode, the inference or evaluation mode, and the compare mode. Um, you can carry out any of these without having to reload your experiment. All you have to do is load load the function required and load it with the respective flags. So for example, if you want to just train, you create experiment and by default it is loaded in the training mode. Um, now if you want to, after having trained a complete model for say five epochs, you know, and having generated a final model with a validation accuracy of 85%, you go on to, you know, switch to eval or infer mode. All you have to do is write this single line command and your model is, or your project and experiment switches from training to, you know, inference and evaluation mode. And now what you can do is you can evaluate the model's performance on a folder of, you know, a folder data set or, you know, single images. So, in the middle, after having run for five epochs, we evaluate model's performance on a validation set. We realize that you know the validation accuracy is a little bit low. So we switch back uh, to training mode. We update the learning rate, right? We will look into how to, what are the parameter, hyperparameters available to us and how to tune this. Just bear with me for now that, you know, we, we switch from, you know, evaluation mode back to training mode. We updated a few hyperparameters and we resume training once again. Um, after having resumed training, we realized that the validation accuracy dropped down a little bit during training. However, you know, with, with a learning rate, with a new learning rate, 
uh, even the validation accuracy on on a data set that the model hasn't seen for the reduces so we realize that you know reducing the learning rate in this case affects accuracy drastically and as a as a developer this is something that you keep on doing reevaluating the perfect hyperparameter to use re-editing it and you know realizing which one works the best so uh, ultimately after having you know changed the learning rate to three different values we realized which value works the best for us another brief feature that we integrated you know early on while building the library was estimating the training time so rather than having to you know run the training and then realizing that it's going to take you know another 20 hours for the training to complete you can quickly run and estimate training time that tentatively tells you that for a given number of epochs say for example if you want to run the current experiment for 50 epochs how much time would would that take uh, in general i mean uh, the predicted time is off by you know around half a minute or so because this, what this does is it takes a small sample from the data set runs it for the given number of epochs and then tries to do that to the entire data um one key feature that we really felt uh in fact, before moving on to this, uh, in case any of you have any doubts, queries, feel free to you know, shoot them at me. I don't suppose anyone has any doubts as of now. I'll, I'll move on. Um, yeah, so coming back onto one of the most critical features. Uh, so as a computer vision developer and a deep learning engineer, uh, you usually would have to you know create an experiment, design, you know, apply a pre-trained neural network and you know run the experiment for say 100 epochs or 500 epochs and see whether you know the accuracy and the valid both the training and the validation accuracies have have you know synced or saturated after some point however uh, most of the times the number of epochs that we usually select initially is a smaller number just to check whether you know the training converges or not you know whether whether the neural architecture that we have chosen is, is able to learn the problem that we are trying to you know, solve here. And more often than not, a lot of neural networks that were traditional or, or older or simpler uh, would not converge on you know, complex problems. So what we try to do is run it for say 10 epochs or five epochs, find out whether you know, the losses are converging or the model is able to successfully learn and then try and train it for more number of epochs. However, uh, say for example, you run an experiment for 100 epochs and you come to realize that you know, the losses did not converge and the model is not good enough. Um, that would lead to you know, a lot of waste of time and compute resource. And in fact, you wouldn't want to do that. Rather, what you do is you run, you know, train a model for 10 epochs, find out if it's converging, if the model is actually converging and you would want to continue from the 10th epoch itself, what you would do is you would call, you know, create a copy of your first experiment, create a new experiment with the same and resume experiment from, you know, resume training from the 11th epoch rather than from epoch zero. That is another feature that we, you know, found really useful for us as, as developers. Lastly, as a key feature, uh, 
we also have you know model visualization in place so uh, this was built before we moved on to building you know custom neural network architectures with mock and this as a tool as a small tool helped us a lot in visualizing whether you know the neural architectures we were creating was was correct or not uh, so usually the, the model visualizer helps in debugging the model that we are building or you know trying to build or design so we have two options here there is a brilliant open source library called netron that we have integrated with monkey for visualizing your model in in a, you know beautiful manner with all the color codings and the connections the individual layer and their shapes are mentioned in each of these blocks and how they are connected to both the input and the final output layers yeah uh, so i guess uh, that was that for some of the basic elemental features present within monk that define how you know a developer could go about building a deep learning model and building a computer vision application however there is still a lot to learn and go about um, some of the things that we are yet to you know cover is how do you know how do we manipulate each of these hyperparameters that are accessible to us what are the accept acceptable data types and how do we you know use export mode or how does an export go about building a computer vision application and what are the hyperparameters being tweaked so we we'll look into some of these in detail we'll definitely run a few notebooks and build a final application out of it um however i would i would really like to request each member of the audience to just go into the study road map uh, check out the getting started road map once and briefly go through each of these notebooks present here uh, try running them in colab they are pretty straightforward just open any notebook present here and you'll get a button on top where with which you can open them in colab um every notebook that we've prepared we've made sure there is a setup instru instruction and the final goals that we are trying to achieve from the notebook you know mentioned on the top so that you know what's the purpose of this notebook and how to utilize it uh, and since there are already set up instructions however i believe you might have to modify the set up instructions depending on the you know the platform that you are using i believe if you go back into the top level repository you have installation you have a separate installation folder with installation instructions for different platforms from linux cpu to linux gpu mac os windows and both for kaggle and colab so i don't think you would have you would face any issues in case you do face issues with setting up monk ai on different platforms and different oss feel free to raise an issue and we'd be happy you know to look into it and resolve that um abhishek uh, you there yeah <clears throat> yeah so even i am receiving the uh, audio a little late so yeah uh, i guess uh, akash yeah, has uh, given uh, let's 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 open up for for chat and then queries from the audience itself let's let's give 10 minutes to Uh, that and then we can you know discuss what's in store for tomorrow. Um, so one of the questions is any real world problems still not solved for Monk AI for for vision sorry. Um, well, <laughs> real world applications well there are a lot. Um, none of them have been solved in fact. And you know building a person detector or an object detector and it's Self isn't solving a problem. Um, what 
I would like to clarify one thing here is is you know uh, when when we are trying to think of an application for any particular domain, having a little bit of an insight about that domain itself definitely helps and you know takes you a longer way down the road. So, for example, just to give you an example, um, if you if you look at applying deep learning and computer vision algorithms to the domain of agriculture, right? Um, if you do not understand what kind of plant diseases exist and what disease affects which plant, building a plant disease classifier or a plant disease detector would be a little hassling for you. I mean, of course, any developer today with the tools available, you know, at, at their hands can build a plant disease classifier. However, uh, to cater to, you know, an organization or a business need or to build an application that, you know, suffices a customer's or a consumer's requirement, you would, uh, you know, having having domain exposure and domain expertise would help you go longer way. Uh, there are applications not just for plant disease detection from, you know, maybe phone cameras, but also predicting yield from satellite imagery. Uh, understanding what affects the yield of a plant would help you, you know, better analyze the features in play here and then we build deep learning algorithms on top of it. Um, so Shivek has asked if my understanding is right, Mongia is just a wrapper on multiple frameworks, just like how fast AI is a wrapper around PyTorch. Um, uh, yes and no. So if you look at fast AI, fast AI is a brilliant wrapper across PyTorch and it really eases the lives of millions of developers across the globe in building computer vision applications. Uh, definitely agree. But if you look at fast AI, uh, just like Keras, uh, it's a wrapper, you know, on top of another widely used framework. So it does have its own, you know, it has its own syntax that you have to follow and a set of standards and nuances that, you know, the library comes from. However, if you, you know, want to switch from fast AI and PyTorch ecosystem to TensorFlow, you would have to understand and learn uh, an entirely new set of, you know, jargons and terms that TensorFlow utilizes in its own, you know, session management or, or you know, uh, tensor units. So, Monk AI, you know, to describe Monk AI, Monk AI is a unified wrapper in a sense that it, it covers different widely used frameworks. So, you know, there is PyTorch, there is MXNet, there is Keras integrated on within it too. We are, you know, TensorFlow and other state-of-the-art libraries are also being integrated as we speak right now. And, you know, so what we've tried to do is keep a standardized syntax or the same workflow for building your project or building your experiment. The backend is, is you know, is something that can be set by you, you know, as a, as a first step. So if your organization requires you to build a computer vision application in MXNet specifically or, you know, PyTorch specifically, then still that, do that with Monk AI. You do not have to go and learn PyTorch. However, the backend, you know, the entire suite of features that are available in PyTorch are accessible as, you know, single line statements or functions or data structures within the Monk AI wrapper. Um, for people looking for collaborations and, you know, looking to participate and contribute to Monk AI, uh, or in fact, looking to work with us, uh, I would re request all of you to just, you know, go through Monk AI once, go through our GitHub repositories once, try setting up the toolkit locally, run a complete end-to-end -end tutorial. So we also have a lot of, you know, hordes of uh, ready-to-use tutorial notebooks wherein you take up a data set and build a final application out of it. Uh, I would request all the members from the audience to just do a trial run once, uh, you know, get back to us with any feedbacks, improvements, or any bottlenecks and challenges that you faced 
while doing so. Report an issue on GitHub maybe. Um, and also you, you can you know request new feature additions. And for people interested in building those features, you know, feel free to reach out to us with a pull request and you know we will be happy to integrate that. Um, so for, so Mayank has asked, will you cover text processing and their scalability? Um, so since tomorrow is the only day remaining, uh, we'll be going over Monk and it's offering again. And, uh, some of the standard workflows that we feel, you know, deep learning engineers and computer vision engineers could utilize to simplify their lives, their day to day lives, since all they have to do is tweak a hyperparameter and evaluate whether their experiment went good or bad. Um, it does not give us a lot of space to discuss individual applications. So for example, we won't have enough time to discuss face recognition or text processing individually. However, uh, what we keep on doing is, so we do have a medium, you know, blogging channel where we keep posting tutorials with end to end application building in mind. Um, and we are, like I previously mentioned too, we are actively working on integrating different algorithms. So till now we have integrated classification and object detection algorithms, uh, most of which are state of the art algorithms. So you do not have to worry if, you know, these are redundant or if there is a newer research available and our contributors are daily working towards, you know, finding out if new research implementation has come in and integrating that to Monkey so that, you know, other developers can use them in an easy workflow. Um, and we are working towards integrating face recognition, image segmentation, text processing, you know, document information extraction, and applications such as these uh, to be integrated into the Monk AI ecosystem. And in fact, we are looking for developers to, you know, and the community itself to, you know, help us build the set of standardizations we are looking for, because uh, an absence of protocols is what hits the domain and you know impedes the growth of a domain. Uh, however, if the community gets together and you know contributes to their own needs and challenges that they face, we feel a, a truer picture and a more honest picture of the, these topics can be built and painted. Yeah, I, I guess uh, Abhishek has just shared the blog links. Lastly, before we, you know, end, just just a small request. Uh, in, if you go on GitHub and you know find our repository and toolkit interesting, do please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, uh, Akash, uh, can we yes, wait uh, for? I mean, yeah, I, I missed out on this point. Like Abhishek has described, uh, Hemant, uh, who was one of the first contributors that we had for Monk AI, uh, got, you know, got a job after learning object detection from Monk. And, you know, that kind of brings the, you know, joys for us in life, uh, building something that has actually helped someone on ground. Um, and precisely, uh, like, like Abhishek mentioned, uh, we not just work towards commercial applications and working with our customers and clients. We also keep on working actively, you know, working towards competitions and research problems, not just on hacker or Kaggle, but also from CBPR and, you know, conferences like NIPS. So these usually, you know, release a lot of competition data sets and competition problems that are, you know, state of the art in, in tackling and that are pretty open-ended. So using using Monk AI and using the research toolkits and approaches that we've built till now, we try and tackle these challenges, these open-ended problems. Uh, in fact, we also have, you know, we were mentioned in CVPR 2018, uh, wherein we stood 12th across 80 teams in the world for, you know, disguised and imposed facial recognition. And we keep on working with our contributors and researchers on, you know, adding more state-of-the-art researches that not just helps you know, improve the offerings of the tool, but also helps the developer themselves 
learn both the algorithm and the nuances of applying that algorithm to different problems. Hello. Um, Akash, am I audible? All right, so uh, Abhishek, in case uh, we, we could wrap up for today, um, leaving our audience with what's in store for tomorrow. If you can quickly, you know, just run through what's in store for our audience tomorrow and then do a wrap up, that'll be good. Um, sure, Akash. Uh, can you confirm that I'm uh, I'm audible or not? Okay, great. Uh, so Akash has given you a very good explanation about uh, what have we uh, what have we uh, built with Monk and the different features that Monk has. We request all of you to go ahead and uh, uh, study those, study and implement those uh, uh, applications as well as other. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, run those Jupyter notebooks on Colab. So this will help us uh, for tomorrow. We'll also rectify this lagging problem uh, that we had today and uh, post that once you are uh, uh, up and running with Monk tutorials tomorrow alongside us, we all will create very good applications uh, in like uh, in both image classification and uh, object detection end. And uh, with that, uh, we'll be able to work on uh, I mean, we, we post that uh, you guys can always contact us, uh, get in touch with us over our social media. You can contact me, Akash, or Adish, anyone or anyone from the team, any of our interns. They'll uh, answer you. Uh, 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 they'll answer all your doubts and issues, or if you want to contribute to uh, contribute with us. We are also uh, available most of the time on LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, you can uh, ping us up uh, if you have any doubts, if you have uh, something. Uh, to add on to, uh, 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 I mean, uh, suggestions for the tool or if you want to contribute. So I guess uh, post this, uh, we can end uh, the today's session. And uh, uh, please try out and do uh, join us tomorrow at the same time, 11 a.m. Uh, we hope to have a more better presentation for you. Akash, do you have anything to add on this? Um, guys, stay safe, stay healthy. Yeah, as Akka said, do stay safe. Stay at your places, stay at your homes or uh, whichever location you are. And uh, one more uh, update that uh, we'll take on more uh, questions and queries tomorrow um, as the session starts. You can also shoot your questions on our social media or GitHub uh, locations and do star the library so that we can sp uh, spread it. OK, then, guys. Have a great day.
Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you so much for attending. Take care.